<laughs> on this blustery of days. This is the Winnie the Pooh Sunday, isn't it? <laughs> um, today we continue with our current worship series, which is Come to the Table. And this is a gorgeous table setting here presented for us by Kathleen. It's a table you will want to sit at even if you didn't eat anything. This week we explore how love is baked into the bread each time we gather around for communion. Hear this, we don't need to save this love for the times just when we partake of the ritual of communion. We invoke love every time we sit down together at our kitchen tables with our families for home-cooked meals or DoorDash or takeout for game night with friends and family or even for difficult conversations with loved ones. Love is present in the sweetest, the bitterest, the spiciest, and the blandest moments in our everyday lives because love is God and God is love. Let us rise now in spirit and as we welcome each other with the singing of Come to the Table. for friendship and family. We prepare our meal of bread and fruit of the vine with compassion. We invite everyone to join in the feast. We are all part of one human family. We are united in love. Please join us in singing the hymn found on page 399 when minds and bodies meet as one, and we're singing verses one, three, and five.
things that humankind has always struggled with, the concept of generosity. <laughs> this tale that I'm going to share with you this morning is probably familiar. It comes to us from the 15th century called Stone Soup. There was once a very poor man who had very little means. He walked for miles and miles and became very hungry. He wandered into this self-sufficient but very insular village where the doors and windows to all the houses were locked and he knew there were people inside. He went to the first house and he knocked on the door. A lady answered the door. I've walked many miles and I'm very tired and hungry. Could you just spare a bit of food for me? The door slammed in his face. He continued to the next house. An elderly man opened the door. Would you please give me a bite to eat for I have walked for many miles and I'm very tired and hungry. I have no extra food, the man answered gruffly and he abruptly shut the door. Now this happened several more times until the man got an idea. At the next house, when the door opened, he said, could I please borrow a big pot from you to make a magic soup? I'm going to make a soup from a stone. Soup from a stone, the villager said. But then they were intrigued and they said, well, yes, I do have a pot. So the villager mockingly gave him the pot and the man took the pot to the center of town, built a fire, placed the pot on the fire, filled it with water, and he began to stir. And as he stirred, villagers began to peek from their windows. They opened their doors, and they all slowly began to move to the center of town to see what this man was doing. The steam began to rise from the pot, so he took a big stone and right before all their eyes, he placed the stone in the pot. And murmurs went through the crowd, did you see that? He says he's going to make a soup from a stone, stone soup, not possible, they said. He began stirring and stirring. And then he tasted the soup. Hmm, it was very delicious, but it would be even better if I had some carrots to put in this soup. <laughs> Someone has carrots? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> He continued stirring, and once again he paused to taste. Mmm, this is almost the best soup I ever made, but it could be better if it had a little, few onions. Okay. Please bring it. <laughs> so he stirred some more, and he said, this is mm, just about the best soup I ever tasted. The only thing that would make it a little better is potatoes and tomatoes. I have tomatoes. Yeah, I have a potato. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Surprisingly, all the villagers began to think of other items that they had in their gardens that might make a good soup. And they began bringing them from all different directions. All the wonderful flavors that would make a very hearty soup indeed. In fact, he had, by the time they had brought all their donations, he had a huge hearty soup. In fact, it was enough to, fill the, to feed the whole town and everybody stayed to eat and laugh and talk together. Now the little man who made the soup enjoyed the result of his magic stone soup. 
He had enough to eat, so did all the village, and they even invited him to spend the night. Although this is a very cunning trick, the stone soup had caused the villagers to come from behind those closed doors in community and to talk and to eat together. So today, at, first, at this church, we're going, inviting you to share some stone soup at the end of service, AKA vegetable soup. It will be in the foyer along with some other things that Kathleen has brought. And we'll just see what kind of magic ensues from all of us eating and laughing and having stone soup together. <laughs> Gracious and loving God, feed us. Feed us carrots and potatoes and tomatoes and stones so that we know where our foundation is and how to open our arms to all. For all the meditations occurring now and in this space and time, may they be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock, our stone, and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. I read the following this week. Jesus often confounded those for whom acceptance was conditional. Those who required specific laws to be followed or else. The litmus test for Jesus was simply love. The Holy One choose or chose time and began and again and again, began again and again to seek out the intention of someone's heart. Who's going to bring the vegetables next time? What happens? When we seek to do no wrong to our neighbor. For the Holy One invites us to gather together and to engage in conversation, maybe over a bowl of soup or a game of dominoes, as a way of moving forward into and through right relationship. And again, the writer asks, what happens when we seek to do no wrong to our neighbor, moving beyond boundaries into reciprocal understanding. Reciprocity, mutuality. I hear this work at kitchen tables where we learn the rules of love in our very current time when it seems to me that the rules of engagement are only focused on slander, libel, bullets, bombs, and police. Where are the kitchen tables? Not banquet tables with white linen tablecloths, but instead where are the kitchen tables? Not the head table where a select few are set apart. The kitchen tables where enough space is there for whoever and whomever shows up. All you have to do is add a piano bench or a stool or the office chair. Pull up another chair. Squeeze in. Go get another place setting. Add a place at the table. 
We began our worship today with the quiet and very gentle pastoral. My shepherd will supply my need. I sat there pondering, huh, I wonder if that's really what it feels like and sounds like when everybody shows up. Maybe a little bit more chaotic at times. And isn't that the peace of mindfulness and meditation is even in the midst of the chaos for whoever shows up at the table. The shepherd supplies that calmness. That deep breathing that can then withstand that chaos. The biblical text today that you'll see on the next page in both Romans and Matthew, it speaks nothing of kitchen tables. It speaks nothing of gathering around one or adding an extra place setting for a beloved. The text speaks nothing of Pillsbury biscuits from a can, hot and buttery for hearty chicken stew, it speaks nothing of a nice, fresh loaf of chewy, crusted bread to savor that chicken stew. The text speaks nothing of games and puzzles, a deck of cards, or a handful of dice. However, I do. Hear the text through this lens of relationships, of kitchen tables, of these rules of engagement. Hear the text at the very core. Rules for and how and of love to undergird our current spaces and time. From Eugene Peterson's understanding, he writes, don't run up debts, it says in Romans, except for the huge debt of love you owe one another. When you love others, you complete what the law has been after all along. The law code, remember that? Don't take someone's life. Don't take what isn't yours. Don't always be wanting what you don't have. And any other don't that you can think of finally adds up to this, the writer of Romans says. We remember that it is about love. The law code is about love. Taking on Matthew's gospel that says we remember to love one another as well as you do yourself. You can't go wrong when you love others. When you add up everything in the law code, the sum total is love. But Matthew adds on this. But make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in the taking care of all your day-by-day -day obligations that you lose track of the time or that your exhaustion gets the better of you because you have failed to be mindful of the Sabbath. For rest is indeed needed to do these complex engagements. So don't doze off, oblivious to the love of God. For the night is about over and dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what love is doing. Love is inviting us not to squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence, in bickering and in grabbing everything in sight. Whew. The invitation I think it's to a kitchen table. It brings us close. This table brings us into more intimacy. However, when we know one another, right, I know this happens, we get lax. We get comfortable. We drop our intentions of full presence. We bring our devices to the table. We sit in front of the television sets. But a kitchen table might just invite us when we are leaning into the rules of love to use this very same comfortability to allow our own righteousness and our own true anger and frustration and truth to emerge and even to erupt. This truth opens us to a new way. This truth with right rules of love to deepen our own intimacy, to more fully express our care and our understanding of mutuality and reciprocity. This is where our concern comes into the picture, to hold this tension of our own open-heartedness within and through our own boundaries of love and care. 
And it is within these true rules of engagement that in these times, I think we are called into grief. I think we're called into sorrow. I think we're called into moments seeking forgiveness, naming our hurts, receiving grace. And it is in these times that I hope, hope, hope that we recognize that isolation cannot heal isolation Time to renew, coming to the table with fun, puzzles, go fish, simple rummy. Here are the rules of love. Instead, we have even made coming to the table for fun into high stakes with million-dollar poker tournaments highlighted on ESPN. I'm like, how do they know how many chips are on the table and how many thousands of dollars that they're betting right now? Where is the joy? of sharing our photos of our images that we capture digitally, watching a, a praying mantis slowly make its way up a stalk. Where is the grief poured out over continued war that expands into other lands? Where is the love poured out seeing the world through a child's eye that sees and experiences it all? Daddy, why is that man holding that sign? Mommy, not knock. Who's there? Cash. Cash who? No, thanks. I prefer peanuts. I wonder. I wonder if we all showed up at the coffee pot or the hot water pot only in our underwear as we slowly awaken in the morning. I wonder if our leaders who can't seem to stop ordering missiles, tanks, and guns and firing their political leader, if still in their own sleepiness, if they gathered with one another and said, you want a cup of coffee? We've stopped coming to these kitchen tables. Instead, we show up at the tailgate with the other 45 people, with our friends, our family, and our roommates, watching one another get plastered. And then, when they collapse in the bathroom, we call the police to come take care of them because we don't want the accountability of following the rules. Let somebody else do that. Isn't that what we pay them for? It is even harder with our neighbors who, on a Saturday afternoon, they're firing off seemingly hundred rounds of ammunition, causing the trees to reverberate, the mountainsides to tremble, and the thunder and the gun-phobic golden retriever named Luke to howl and cower in the corner while the two- and the five-year-old toddlers are crying incessantly. And so we call the sheriff, come do something. The rules of love say, go to their neighbor. Probably not right now, but in a quieter time. Address them. Seek to be in relationship with them. And in this relationship with our friends, our roommate, our spouses, we must ask for the keys to the car when that one has had too much to drink or is under another influence. It's in our relational and transformational work of love to take home that roommate, that spouse, that loved one, Make sure they're safe. Make sure they know that they're loved before heading back to the stadium, to the party, or to the couch. I think it's because of this that when I read this text earlier in the week, the second and third and fourth time, I just got mad. And the tears began to upwell right now. I just got mad reading it. Because it made these rules of love seem so straightforward and easy. They are not. Reading the text within the greater picture to forgive often, to pray always, to see the world through a child's eyes. We forget that there is this complex set of daily operations. We forget that we are truly set up for love. But it is work. We forget that we have been given the ways of love, but we have forgotten them we forget because the rules of engagement have become dialing 911 or walking out the door or rolling up the window or looking straight forward and not making eye contact. This table, this table of love that says 
or that actually we say is God's, that if we say is God's and we claim our own divine and beloved created in the imago dei, we claim then that it is all of ours. This table we are called to remember. Do this in remembrance of me. The tables are calling us to remember. The big technical word is amnesis. Reverend Ben Hensley writes, a vital aspect of Holy Communion is remembrance, but it is a special kind of remembrance. Liturgical scholarship uses the big word amnesis, which is derived from the Greek. When Jesus says, do this in am and amnesis of me. The term means a remembering that takes into account all of time, past, present, and future. The commandment to love is baked into the ritual of communion itself. This is the work of kitchen tables. Coming to them in our work clothes, smelling of chainsaw fuel and mulch. And even looking disheveled, fresh out of bed and in your underwear. Tables of love squeeze into another and another. And we continue to say, pull up a chair, asking, what do you need to know so that you can understand a, a fuller hope and a deeper patience and an edgier mercy? And the truth is, we got to practice. Tables of love welcome dirty fingernails, Rolex, Breitling, and Timex watches, all of them. Maybe even your eye watch if you promise not to twitch and look at its every buzz and radiating light, distracting you from the work of love. And we got to practice. I know that there are those among us who were taught that you could not come to this table until you had gone until every neighbor and repented of your sins and made every last sin and foul word or unholy deed okay and you were just fine not coming to communion every week if you had to do that every time. And then on the other side of the swinging pendulum, there are those who were taught to come to the table every week to daily confess to God and receive an assurance of pardon. And that with a chew of a wafer and a sip of the cup, life was good, right, and true, just like that. Somewhere. Somewhere in between these two, there are rules of love that make space for our questions, our tears, our heartbreak, our exuberant joy, and a deck of cards for Rummy for or maybe even a handful of dice for Yahtzee or Farkle. The table of love says, I know of complexity. I know of hope. I know of forgiveness, I know of wonder, I know of grace. And we got to practice these rules of love in safe spaces where it's okay to misstep, where it's okay to misstep, where it's okay to unleash our unharnessed and our unfiltered rage so that we can accept the coaching and we can understand and, and corral that into safer, more love transformed practices and presence. The table is indeed ready. You indeed are invited to show up, have a seat, and plan to partake of all that is offered. May each and every one of us engage in these rules of love. Amen and amen.
we are grateful for your love that is shown to us and folks around us and moments of kindness and compassion and soup that is created out of what the community has and shares with one another. We long for that table of love where truly love will welcome all those who have been categorized as last and least. God, we often wish that unconditional love was as easy as Hallmark cards make it seem. Instead, we get lost in all the things that divide us, in identity, in status, in what someone might owe us. God, we lament these divisions and display of that division that we have seen this week uh, in places like the Middle East. We lament the genocide that is happening before our eyes and our part in it as we have turned a blind eye to Palestinians who have been trapped in Gaza for years. We pray for those situations that we have been blind to or we have chosen not to see. God, we know that simply love cannot fix these divisions, but we know that unconditional love calls us to action, to stand up against division, to show compassion and kindness to one another. Help us to practice that kind of love. Amen and amen. pray for those around the world and we also pray for those listed in our worship guide and now we offer names aloud that we are praying for as a community Danny Linda Suzanne Sarah Justin Sarah Jennifer Tirza Maggie Barbara, Erica, Mike, Howard and Michael, Linda, as this table calls us to community, we pray for all these loved ones. May they know an unconditional love that comes for them and cares for them, whatever their circumstance. Amen and amen. This table we lift our voices in prayer. At this table we find your peace. At this table. I'm going to invite you to look around in this space. Look at the gifts that are here. Look at all the virgins of virgins of Imago Dei that are here. Oopsie. The holy and the divine is in this place. Maybe virgin or not, I don't know. <laughs> There's so many gifts when you show up at the table, at a kitchen table for a walk. And within the diversity of all the faces here and all the images of God, you know, this allows us to hold multiple truths at once. There is so much to be grateful for. And truth be told, there are so many evil forces 
that are bearing down on our very lives. May we honor joy. May we honor pain. So often I think we feel like we have to choose between either remaining to be attuned to the pain of the world around us and or maybe keeping our spirits afloat. We have to choose sometimes between being serious about our convictions and assessing the ease and the delight of any present moment. I invite us to consider that we are called and we are offered a promise of a more integrated way We long to know how to protect the full breadth of our humanity and that of our neighbors, both literally next door and across lands and oceans. This is the full spectrum of life, and we invite it. We hope for it. We yearn for it to flourish. And so may we let them coexist with gratitude for our God of love, for the love, for the holy imago dei, that is grace, that it may meet us wherever we are. And it is within this that we offer our great our gifts here, whether they be to keep the lights on and to pay the bills, or of stone soup that is out on the table, or of setting up a beautiful altar, or of punching buttons, or of playing music. May all these gifts be gathered here today.
invite you to join me in the dedication of all these offerings found in your worship guide. It's out of thanksgiving, gratitude, and joy that we offer these gifts of ourselves, our engagement, our faith, and our material goods. May they be blessed and found faithful, co-creating a world of holy wholeness right before our eyes. And indeed, outside on the table there is amazing soup that smells delicious, and fruit and cheese and crackers. And so hear this blessing as we literally are creating and accepting love right here at our tables. On these gifts of protein, carbohydrates, fiber, vitamins, and minerals, we receive this grace and this love that nourishes our very bones, muscles, cells, and mental processing and open hearts. May our bodies be blessed and found faithful so that we may understand and take these connections of spirit out into the world, remembering the body that we are called to be, literally co-creating a world of holy wholeness right before our eyes. Are there announcements for the good of the community? You need a microphone. You want to come up here? Nope. Good. Can you hear me? Okay. I have two very important announcements to make. Um, we have a church council meeting. It's actually going to be this week on a Wednesday and Thursday. And just as always, um, congregation members, you're invited to join us in a church council meeting. We'll actually be meeting with uh, Beth Kinnick for Center for Congregational Health. Congregational Health. It's going to be a short 45-minute meeting on Monday, uh, excuse me, on Wednesday, and then again on Thursday. It'll be a duplicate meeting. And this is just a beginning phase of the future of our church, and we have a long way to go. Um, I need to share my second announcement, and Susan, the, uh, sorry about that. We'll send you out a Zoom link, 5 o'clock, 5 to 545. And again, um, she's meeting with council to let us know our next steps, but in full transparency, we just want uh, you to be there if you want to be there and listen in. So, um, second announcement, which is probably a little more important than the first announcement. I'm going to read an email to you Susan Sage sent to council last night. And it says, hi folks, I'm hoping for an onslaught of pledges either tomorrow or next Sunday. The finance team is charged with drawing up the 2024 budget. The total reflects, this total, reflects the money pledged plus 15%. Last year's budget was roughly $140,000. Pledges received so far, including the 15%, are $75,000. And we have a road ahead of us. So that was ad lib, me. Um, many of you plan on giving. Thank you for that. The finance team just needs a heads up to make our budget happen. Any help you can give, you can provide in the next two weeks is greatly appreciated. So we need you. We need you. I'm sorry. For those, of, For those of you who are online, uh, Susan also said email it to Susan, and you can do that. You don't have to have it written out and put an offering plate or anything like that. Thank you, Susan. That's okay. Anybody else? Announcements for the good of the community? Know this week is going to be a full week here. Wildwood will be here Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday as they are this year, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And sometime in the next few hours, uh, we will also receive a uh, adventure work crew, service crew from Roanoke College that is here to work with Wataga Habitat. And they will live right where you are standing right now. And so if you feel any desire to come and help feed them or uh, enjoy them, they will be here all week through next Sunday. Anybody else? Announcements for the good of the community? I have one quickie. 
So you'll see in your worship guide that we literally are practicing. We have adjusted our worship time to make more space for you to stay and practice how to be loved, how to offer grace, how to do those hard, complex things known as relationships. So Melanie and Kath are here. And uh, where do you want to be in this big space or do you want to be outside on the pavilion or in the handbill room? They're going to be in the handbill room unless it gets too big and then they will adjust from there. Um, Jackie Henry is going to be doing work around mindfulness so that when we get into those complex situations, we can stay centered. Where would you like to be, Jackie? Um, I'll take this space right here. Right here in this corner. She's going to be right here in this corner. I'd and like to be on the stage behind me. Yeah. So there'll be about... 10, about 15 minutes, so you have plenty of time to get a bowl of soup and to fill your belly up. So there's no excuse that I was hungry and I had to leave. So you're welcome to go get a bowl of soup and then join in in the conversation. And then I will start out in the pavilion, and if it's too cold out there, we'll find us a space. If this worship service has somehow uh, stirred something up in you and you want to talk about that or talk about what the theology might look like and sound like of worship and what that, that is. Anybody else before we offer our final song? Craig, do you need a microphone? For the good of the community, uh, I would like to point out that in a publication called The Guardian, William Barber published an article this weekend in which he not only obviously and needfully condemns the violence of the Hamas, but he also takes to task the violence that is the self-justifying self-righteousness of collateral damage done in seeking vengeance on Hamas. This is an old story, but it's a fresh look at an old story that William Barber gives us. Thank you. With that, as we sing this final hymn, it's called De Coloris, which talks about this colors of God's love that shows up in all of our lives in a variety of places. We're going to sing both verses. We are not going to sing the one in Spanish. Is that correct? If you feel like you want to sing it in Spanish, you are welcome to sing in Spanish in, in honor and uh, respect of all those different forms of the Imago Dei. So let us sing together De Coloris. So we're singing about fall colors in, in Hispanic Heritage Month. And so let us join in that song.
well done. Well, well done. Uh, it's so exciting to see some faces that we haven't seen here in a few weeks. I'm excited and want to say welcome home, welcome back, and know that in the month of October, we still have our book, and so as you consider your financial commitment, I hope that you are also imagining your own commitment of presence or gift of praying for this community and otherwise somehow supporting this community. And if that is you, in whatever season that you want to commit to this space and this people and this community of faith, uh, I'm inviting you to come sign the book again. Uh, this is becoming our new tradition that you decide, what season am I committing to? And maybe you understand in your brain that is a quarter, that is a month, that is six months. Whatever that means for you, uh, I invite you to come and to sign this book before you leave today. With that, I'm going to invite each and every one of us to offer this benediction to ourselves and to one another together. This table of love requires much of us. It insists that we love one another as we love ourselves and that we love ourselves as we love others. Love asks that we raise one another up by saying, yes, you are worthy. You are welcome at this table. When we surrender to the mysterious ways of love, we may be surprised to find just how much there is to go around. The grace of God abounds. The invitation of Christ is wide. The power of the transforming spirit will surprise us every time. May the blessings of love find you here. Go with you and move through you to others wherever you go this week. Amen and amen. I'm really... Yeah.